Good morning and welcome to Light Reflections from First Friends. We are glad you have chosen to join us for this virtual worship service and hope you find it beneficial to your spiritual journey. We consider this an abbreviated version of our in-person meeting for worship for those wishing to join us from a distance. If this is your first time joining us, First Friends is a thriving, progressive Quaker meeting in the city of Indianapolis, Indiana. We consider ourselves a loving, inclusive, joyous gathering of people seeking to know truth under the leadership of God's Spirit. All are welcome, no matter race, age, cultural background, sexual orientation and identity, marital status, physical and mental ability, family structure, or economic circumstance. Our hope is that through this worship experience, you will discover our faith community is unlike any other, where silent meditation is as important as the spoken word, where we emphasize the importance of one's personal encounter with the divine, and where we seek to support one another as we discover truth together. Now we invite you to center down and enter this virtual worship space with us. Welcome to Light Reflections. This week our scripture reading is one of the many Proverbs in the Bible. It is from Proverbs 8, verse 15, and I'm reading it from the Message Translation. Wise men and women are always learning, always listening for fresh insights. This week many of us are thinking about school, especially as most children, youth, teachers, educators, and administrators headed back to the classroom this week in Indy. While I was growing up, the first day back always entailed a lot of anticipation, anxiety, stories of summer trips, and yes, exhaustion from usually sleeping in until noon for the prior two months. Thinking back, most of my memories from the first days of school are rather boring. I remember having typical issues with my locker combination, going to the wrong classroom one time, and in junior high deciding to wear way too much of my new school clothing on that first day of school and almost overheating since it was in the upper 80s 
and we had no air conditioning. But boy, was I styling in my Coca-Cola long sleeve shirt, jeans, and new denim jacket on the last week of August in Indiana. <laughs> Most of high school, our son Lewis wore shorts, even when it was 23 degrees and snowing. Well, not all first days of school are typical. Let me read you some stories people shared from allmomdoes.com. When my son started first grade, he forgot to get off the bus on his way home. And when the bus driver finished his route, he asked, asked him where he lived. And he said, I don't know. My first day at kindergarten had been such a fun and exciting day. And I had met a little boy who is my new friend. I was so wound up and excited on the way home on the bus that I threw up on him in my favorite striped tights. On my son's first day of riding the school bus, he fell asleep and didn't get off the bus. The bus went back to the garage. I called the school to let them know that he had never got off the bus, and the bus driver went to the back of the bus and found him sound asleep. I remember my mom always telling me to wear underwear in case you got in an accident. So when I started grade one or two, I didn't wear any and decided to play on the monkey bars. The teacher brought me in to ask me why I wasn't wearing any, and I told her that I didn't want to get in an accident and miss school. As I was reading these stories, I was struck by a memory I had tried to forget from a, my first day of high school. First day of high school is full of so many anxieties, but I was confidently going to take my new high school by storm. I dressed up for the first day as a freshman, looked very preppy as we said back then, had my backpack and tennis bag for practice after school and was determined to get to my locker and hang out with some friends just for a while before my first class. But as I was heading in, I decided I better use the restroom before starting my day. Thinking on my feet, I chose, chose to use the restroom across from the counseling services in the vice principal's office since it would be low traffic. I proceeded in and found it completely empty. Never being in this restroom before, I was taken aback by the round trough style urinal in the middle of the room. Please note, I was completely unaware of the wall style urinals on the wall directly behind me. As I'm taking care of business, the vice principal of all people comes in, gives me the weirdest look, simply steps on the bar on the floor around what I thought was the round urinal and begins to wash his hands. In my horror, I finished, looked around, and realized there were no sinks. The vice principal smiled and said, first day of high school? I answered, yep, and ran out as quick as possible. Now let, let's get a bit more serious. Education is, a vitally, impor is vitally important in our world today. It has always been vitally important to Quakers as well. Even though Quakers would never say that education alone was sufficient to make anyone a minister, which we all are, it has always had an important role in the Society of Friends. In many ways, early Quakers were blazing a trail for providing education for all people. George Fox advised in his day that schools should be provided for both girls and young maidens, as well as for boys, in whatever things were civil and useful in the creation. William Penn also held and expressed at length advanced views on the importance of right methods of aim and aims in the education of children. Private schools were opened in Pennsylvania as early as 1683, but with Penn's work, friends opened public schools in Philadelphia as early as 1689 for all people, even girls, Native Americans, immigrants, and former slaves. They believed from the outset that the schools could nurture that of God in everyone, and should therefore be available to all. Now I'd be remiss if I did not say that not all schools had the intentions that Penn wanted. Some became elitist, others became anything but public, and some were no different than the native boarding schools Pope Francis has been asking forgiveness from among the Native Americans and indigenous people of Canada. This was wrong, and we too must acknowledge our involvement. Yet Penn's original intentions and his public schools put friends on the cutting edge of the development of educational opportunities and standards in the United States. Actually, the Quaker elementary and secondary schools in several states are still today considered 
the forerunners of the public school system. My wife, Sue, a public school teacher, often goes to conferences where she learns about the Quaker influence and foundations for public schools right here in Indiana. One of the reasons I believe this is so important, not just because I'm married to a public school teacher, is because education to Quakers was originally intended to be holistic, to teach critical thinking, to help people engage with the planet, their communities, their neighbors, and their experience with God. For the last week, I've been putting together our fall sermon series. And while looking specifically at the set of queries offered to us in our faith and practice, I turned to a section titled Education. I rarely quote from our faith and practice for multiple reasons, but this day I was drawn to a quote under the subheading, The Aim of Education. It begins with this line from London Yearly Meeting in 1924. The aim of education is the full and harmonious development of the resources of the human spirit. Wow, this sounds much like what Nobel Prize and literature winner Rabin Dranath Tagore said almost the same year Quakers wrote that statement in London. He said, the highest education is that which does not merely give us information, but makes our life in harmony with all existence. Let's be honest. Education is about way more than taking tests or getting degrees, or for that matter, it's more than a vocation or even a career. As the London Yearly Meeting concluded, the person whose mind is many-sided has a special contribution to make to the solution of the complex personal and social problems of modern life. Now, obviously, we are a meeting. We're a meeting and not a public school. But I believe First Friends is dedicated to developing that many-sided mind for the sake of our neighbors and our world. From early on, the Quaker understanding of education has had some common characteristics that I believe we need to return to, we need to embrace again, and even instill in our lives and in the lives of our children and adults today. To become people with many-sided minds that can contribute and make needed changes to the complex personal and social problems of current times, we need to be people who are willing to learn through inquiry. This begins with what I talked about last week in my sermon, asking ourselves and our neighbors queries that prompt us to go deeper and even wrestle with our beliefs. One of the best people I know at this is Beth Hendricks, our associate pastor. She's always asking questions in meetings and conversations. Sometimes it surprises me, but it always leads to more knowledge. It also means being willing to learn new things. Like our friend Kent Farr told us last week, when he ordered a textbook on dinosaurs. You and I need to be continual learners, constantly asking questions, wanting to know what and when and how and why instead of blindly following people, especially politicians and authorities and yes, even your pastor. I know you don't always agree with me, but when you don't, I hope you take the time to inquire about why. We also need to be people who learn through reflection. This also has something to do with last week's message. To reflectively learn means to take time to analyze your own beliefs and experiences, to test what you know and what you think you know. Taking time for reflection may happen through waiting worship or through times of silence and solitude, maybe a retreat, even moments of pause. I know for me, I like to turn off the car radio on occasion and reflect on my commute. As well, we need to learn through collaboration or working together. Often Quakerism can be seen as a very individualistic society. Yet, I believe our greatest learning opportunities arise when we interact and collaborate with other people, especially those different than us. And let's admit it, everyone is different than us. We all have differing views and beliefs and experiences. Sure, we have similarities and at times stark contrasts, but when we take the time to really get to know our neighbors, and fellow friends, things begin to change. It's part of, what harmo that, part of that harmonious aspect of Qua that Quakers saw it. We must admit that part of the process of educating ourselves is being able to acknowledge our differences and challenge one another to new possibilities. We also need to learn through service. As I was reflecting about my high school days this week, I also remembered all the service events I took part of it during high school. 
from drywalling apartments in South Carolina for the Daughters of the Confederacy with my youth group after a hurricane destroyed their homes, to building a playground at our church camp that still is standing today for families to enjoy. Each time we serve, make a meal for someone, drive someone to an appointment, clean the snow off someone's driveway, serve at the food pantry, you name it. We learn something about ourselves and about others. This then leads to one of the most important aspects, building a culture of respect for all people. I continue to hear that America has lost its culture of respect, and when I turn on the news and watch what is going on around me, it's hard not to agree. Yet when I see something lost or missing in our world, my first response is we need to teach this again. This also, I believe, is the Quaker way. Building respect takes time, and a society of friends, we need to lead by example in our world today. To learn a culture of respect begins with being willing to, and at the least, listening to one another. And to grow that respect will also take learning to care for people and help them. And as one of my mentors taught me, respect comes when you encourage people to be themselves instead of trying to change them into what you want. Too often the church has done just that, and it has left us asking for forgiveness one too many times. I sense that if we committed to just those three things this week, listening, caring, and encouraging people to be themselves, we would begin to see the change needed in our world today. Let me stop there this week and let's take some time to ponder how we can continue to educate ourselves and be an example to our world. Ask yourself, what questions do I need to be asking about life? When do I find time to pause and reflect? Who could I work alongside and collaborate with? Who should I be serving, caring for, and helping? And how am I helping create a culture of respect at First Friends in my family and in my community? Let us ponder these queries as we enter waiting worship this morning.
We close this time of worship with a Quaker prayer. God, open our eyes and unstop our ears that we may see your light and may hear your heartbeat reflecting and resounding within our chests, in those of all our neighbors near and far, in all creatures and plants and in the ground we walk upon. When we finally are able to yield to the leading of your rhythm and flow, may we come to walk cheerfully over the world, answering that of you in all. Amen. Have a great week, friends.